Okay, welcome back to our second video on CP and IP. Uh, one last CP one before we jump into the IP stuff. Uh, and I want to just remind us of a certain strategy that we use to prove biconditionals in chapter three. And so uh, what I want you to use here is the same sort of reverse engineering technique, which is, you know, we're trying to practice CP here. Uh, you've got this premise, you're trying to prove this conclusion from it. Uh, it says everything is such that if it's F, then it's G. Therefore, if something is F, therefore something is F, if and only if something is both F and G. Makes sense, right? Um, that should be a valid argument, and it is. Um, but how do you prove it, right? If I've got just this premise, what's my next step, right, to get to this? Well, I don't know. Uh, maybe I should make an assumption to try to help myself out a bit and get started. Um, but you know this isn't a conditional so what would be what would i assume and what would i be looking for well let's take a hard look at our conclusion here and once again let's reverse engineer it um, go ahead and convert this by conditional into two conditionals pause now and see if you can do that All right, hopefully you were able to get it, but uh, basically what you're looking at is a situation like this, right? First you would use a quiv to turn it into two conditionals, and then you calm and sim them apart. So here's conditional one, and here's conditional two that you get, right? So it's if this, then this, and it's if this, then that, right? So what you're going to do is you're going to use CP twice. You're going to use CP to prove this conditional. You're going to use CP to prove this conditional. Then you're going to conjoin these together, just like we have here in reverse, and uh, equip them back into this. So uh, pause now and see if you can't go ahead and finish this proof. Okay, here's your uh, hint for it, right? So the first one we're going to prove is this one, and you can do them in any order, it won't matter, but if we're going to show this conditional, we're going to assume the antecedent and try to find the uh, consequence. So we've got the assumption here, assumption, and that's what we're looking for in the consequent. Uh, pretty short, straightforward to find it given the premise that you have available, right? So you instantiate this EI first, right? Then you're going to universally instantiate, because it applies to everything, modus ponens, FV and GV, and you existentially generalize in here, because what you're looking for is the existentially generalized statement, right? Okay, having found what you were looking for, you discharge, boom, first thing you assumed, arrow, last thing you got, okay. Uh, but uh, the problem's not done, right? You've got a, that's, that's one of the two conditionals you needed. You needed the other one. So go ahead and see if you can't figure out how to get this one continuing on from there. Pause now. Okay, uh, hopefully you were able to figure it out, but all you're going to do now is you're going to assume this, and then from that, try to prove this thing, and all you have available is the premise, and you now have this available as an undischarged assumption as well. We won't need it, but um, yeah, so what we do is we assumed this guy, and now we're looking for this guy, and uh, be careful to go to a V1 instead of V, which already occurs on a previous line, right? Um, and we can... Uh, universally instantiate existentially inst we could just existentially instantiate this guy no universal needed and then just strip off the fv because that's all that's needed what we're trying to get to uh, existentially generalize in terms of x because that's what we're looking for discharge and here you are but boom we're not done yet right we were asked to prove this okay and all you've got so far are these two conditionals so do you remember how to prove by conditionals how we finished your hint is in your reverse engineering from the beginning, pause now and see if you can't finish it. Okay, so finishing it is no big deal whatsoever, right? You can join the two conditionals to get uh, to get this guy here or this guy here, right? And once you have two conditionals conjoined with the right parts in the right places, you can equip them to the desired conclusion, which is what we've done here. 
And that is the structure, if you recall from chapter 3, for proving by conditionals. Use conditional proof twice, conjoin the two conditionals together, and equiv back to the conditional in question. So that's a strategy that's alive and well, and you should definitely be familiar with it for your exams and, um, and, and, and for your class. All right, so let's uh, just keep clipping along here. And what we have now is a transition away from uh, CP and to IP. So we're going to start uh, our first example of an indirect proof now. And, uh, you know, I want to start uh, pretty simply. Now, given this premise, you may be able to sort of uh, figure out a way to reach the conclusion confidently um, on your own. And uh, that's absolutely fine. But by way of practicing indirect proof, uh, let's go ahead and see if we can do that. And the uh, key feature of it is that uh, just like in chapter 3, it's structurally the same as was the case with I, uh, CP. And so with IP, what you're going to do is let's suppose you're, you're, you're trying this one and you're stuck and you're like, man, I just don't know where to go from here. Well, one thing that you can try is you can try an indirect proof, which requires you to consider the negation of the conclusion. So up here as sort of scratch work right here, um, Pause and write down the negation of the conclusion. Do that now. Okay, easy enough. So this is the conclusion, right? And so the negation of it is just this. And if you wrote it down without these two, uh, that, that will work too. Though sometimes it can be a little bit faster if you actually have the two negations. So uh, let's see what's, the, what's going on here. So in this particular case, go ahead and assume the negation of what you're trying to prove, which is this, right? And uh, make that an assumption. And what you would be looking for in this case is a contradiction, something of the form P and not P. So pause now and see if doing that you can't uh, figure it out. Okay, so uh, it's not too bad, right? I mean, what you do is you find, you take, you assume the negation of what you're trying to prove, right? And you write assumption, P and not P. And now what we're doing is we're just going to use all of this information that we have in order to find a contradiction. And as soon as we find a contradiction, we're going to uh, close off and uh, discharge our assumption and then uh, use the standard operating procedure. So in this particular case, right, we assumed uh, the negation of what we were trying to prove. I also did a little trick on uh, what was here, just bringing this outside to the inside and, and making it a universal in case I ever need it. And I did that before I made an assumption so that it would be available throughout the proof whenever I need it. But now with the assumption, I assume the negation of what I'm trying to prove and um, you know, then I clean it up with double negation. I existentially instantiate, and that's nice, right? I've got my existential instantiation first, which now I can use a UI whenever I want um, without any trouble. And so FV and GV, um, FV, right? This is really nice. Since I've got the FV and I know everything is such that it's not FV, I can generate my contradiction really quickly. Having found my contradiction, P and not P, I discharge my assumption, right, and I write down the thing I assumed, arrow, the last thing I got, which in this case is a contradiction, right, we're doing a proof by contradiction, and then the format is the exact same as it was in chapter 3, LNC, right, law of non-contradiction, so if this is true, then it's not, then it's the case that FV and not FV, but it can't be the case that FV and not FV. So modus tollens, cleaning up with double negation, and uh, that establishes the conclusion, right? So the procedure for indirect proof is identical to what it was in chapter three when we were just working with propositions, right? Assume the negation of what you're looking for, find a contradiction, close off modus tollens, uh, or LNC modus tollens, and then uh, if need be, um, a double negation, and you might have to do a quantifier uh, negation at this point as well. Okay, so another thing we can do is we can nest an IP assumption within a CP assumption. So make a CP assumption, then within that make another IP assumption. So 
Uh, let's look at an example of how that works, and it follows the exact same pr procedure and structure as with the propositional case in chapter 3. So um, let's suppose that you had this premise, and you were supposed to get this, and you were stuck. All right. The question is, is uh, what kind of um, uh, CP assumption might you make? So, um, and in fact, we're just going to go CP and IP. So uh, can you convert this... Uh, conclusion here into a form where both a CP and an IP assumption sort of emerge within that. So strip down this conclusion, rid it of its quantifiers, and let's look at it sort of um, completely broken down with a CP and an IP assumption. Pause now. Okay, hopefully you've had a chance to uh, figure that out, but it's not too bad, right? All you need to do is you need to take the quantifier off, and now you're left with a conditional, right? And what's cool about the conditional is now you're basically ready to go. Um, you can just assume this and look for this, and that would work in this problem. That would be all you need, but to practice nesting the IP assumption within that, let's say that you assumed the FU and you still couldn't find the GU. Well, then what you could do is within that is you could make an IP assumption of not GU and try to find uh, a contradiction. So putting all of that together, what you're going to end up with is something like this. Okay, we're going to assume not FU, and that's going to be an assumption, and we are now looking for GU, right? We assume not FU, and we're looking for GU. Uh, but let's suppose we were still stuck and didn't know how to get the conclusion from that. Well, we could consider nesting another uh, uh, assumption in there, this time an IP assumption, an indirect proof assumption. Since we're looking for GU, we would assume the negation of what we're looking for, which would be not GU, and which we have here. And uh, that would be an assumption, and we're looking for a contradiction. So with that start and hint on this one and this way of doing it, uh, pause now and see if you can't finish it correctly. All right, hopefully you were able to get it. Um, but basically what you're doing is after you do not GU, you're looking for a contradiction. So we'll universally instantiate the first premise that gives you FU or GU. You know you have not GU, so you're going to be able to get, uh, uh, and not FU, you're going to be able to get GU and not GU. There's your contradiction, so you discharge this assumption, not GU, arrow, the last thing you got, which was the contradiction. Then you follow your contradiction sort of IP thing, you do LNC, modus tollens, double negation, and having found what you were looking for from this assumption, you discharge it, so you get the first thing you assumed, arrow, the last thing you got, and then from there it's uh, pretty quick to just universally instant, uh, generalize to build the desired conclusion. So that would be one way of solving this particular problem where you have two assumptions, one a CP and then an IP nested within it, and you'll note it has the exact same structure of the, uh, of the nested um, IPs within CPs from chapter 3 with propositional logic. Okay, one last problem, and I want to practice uh, nesting two CP assumptions within each other. So you make a CP assumption, and then within that assumption you make another CP assumption. So no IP in this particular one. So let's take a look at this particular guy, and it might help to break down the conclusion, which we have here, and so that you can sort of see what it looks like without quantifiers as conditionals and see what your conditional assumptions are and what you're looking for in each case. So break down the conclusion now. Pause now. And bereft of quantifiers, you're left with this. And then if you were to assume the antecedent, you would be left with another conditional. And you can assume the antecedent of that one and look for its consequent, right? So uh, with that hint, pause now and see if you can't finish this one. So here's my hint. I started by instantiating these so that I would have them. And you can finish it from there. But let's say we made our our JU assumption, and then we were looking for if FU, then HU, and then we assumed FU, and we were looking for HU. Can you finish it from there? Pause now.
All right, hopefully you're able to get it, right? And then you just close them off one by one and build it in order and universally generalize at the end. And that's CP within site CP. All right, we're out of time. We'll see you on the next video, Logic fans. Keep working the problems in the text and practicing.